Здравствуйте, товарищи! Welcome to SSSR, Super Secretnya Stabilnya Raketa, the series where I recreate historic Russian spacecraft in Kerbal Space Program and where we look at the fascinating history of Russian spaceflight. In the previous episode we looked at the failed N1 moon rocket and how it could have succeeded. Click on the icon in the upper right hand corner if you want to watch that and maybe give it a thumbs up. In this episode we will set our gaze even further. We're going interplanetary. We're going to see how Russia conquered an utter hell beast of a planet, Venus. If you enjoy space related things, ludicrous spacecraft designs and or the game Kerbal Space Program, make sure you subscribe to this channel and click on the little bell, crush the bell, so you will get notified of new episodes in this series. I promise I'll try to make it worth your while. Venus. Its namesake may be the goddess of love, but the planet Venus is unforgiving to say the least. The conditions on the second planet from our sun are inhospitable, even though its size, mass and gravity are very close to that of Earth. But step onto the surface of Venus and you would die a very gruesome death. The atmospheric pressure alone would crush you immediately, since it is 92 times higher than what your body is used to, similar to what you would experience almost a kilometer deep in the ocean. While you're being crushed, you would also burn to death with surface temperatures of at least 462 degrees Celsius, that's around 860 degrees Fahrenheit. All of that while you suffocate on the 96.5% carbon dioxide and 3.5% nitrogen atmosphere. Oh, and while being burned, your skin would be flayed by winds of 360 km an hour. Those would also blow away your crushed and charred remains a few seconds later. So yeah, not the ideal holiday destination. The Soviets decided to go anyways, at least with robotic equipment. But why Venus and not Mars with its much more benign environment? The answer lies in orbital physics. It requires less delta V to reach Venus, which meant larger payloads could be sent and it could be reached faster than Mars. The first attempt for a flyby, Venera 1, was already launched on February 12, 1961. It actually was the second of two identical craft, but the second was a complete failure. Both were launched on the Molnia booster, another variant of the R7, as we already discussed in a previous episode. Link up top in the little info widget. There was a world first the Russians managed with the Venera 1. It was the first spacecraft ever to feature a Yulich engine. You see, unlike Stark Kerbal Space Program, you can't just start up an engine at any time in space. Due to the zero-g environment, propellants slosh around in the tank. This can lead to vapor in the fuel lines, preventing the engine to start. A Eulage motor uses a different kind of propulsion than the main engine and provides just enough forward momentum for the fuel to settle at the bottom of the tank. Once the pumps of the main engine kick in, propulsion will work normally. This behavior is modeled in the Realism Overhaul suite of mods available for Kerbal Space Program. Venera 1 was sent into an orbit towards Venus, but an attempt to communicate with the vehicle two weeks after launch failed, and it continued to its destination without any means of transmitting data. On its final session a week prior, the craft did however verify an observation made by the moon impactor Luna 2, which we discussed in a previous episode. That vehicle was the first to discover solar wind during its 36-hour journey to the Moon. Venera 1 confirmed that this phenomenon was present everywhere in deep space. So while the main goal did not succeed, the mission still delivered valuable scientific data. Well, all was not lost then. The Americans beat the Soviets to a Venus flyby on December 14, 1962, when Mariner 2 sailed past our planetary neighbor. It performed a lot of experiments, amongst them temperature readings and measuring the magnetosphere of Venus, resulting in a massive data package for the time, as was demonstrated with this printout. But the Russians stayed determined and stuck to their approach of launching multiple iterations of the same thing until it works. Stay on target! 
On October 18, 1967, Venera 4 entered Venus's atmosphere and performed the first ever measurements of another planet's atmosphere. It did so by dropping a ball-shaped probe with a diameter of 1 meter, coated with a heat shield that could withstand up to 11,000 degrees Celsius. It was also capable of surviving up to 450 g of acceleration, or in this case rather deceleration, which was tested in a centrifuge. The pressure vessel was rated for 25 bar, that's 25 times the pressure of Earth's atmosphere at sea level. The small probe survived the brutal error breaking, enduring the maximum of its heat shield tolerance and logging deceleration forces of up to 300 g at one point. Venera 4 managed to send back atmospheric and radar altimeter data back to Earth. Transmission ceased, however, after descending 26 kilometers towards the surface. The data that was sent back gave the scientists information about chemical composition, temperature and pressure of Venus's atmosphere. The results were surprising, because the researchers expected water to exist on Venus. However, there was almost none. Just 0.1 to 1.6% of the atmosphere were water vapor and no liquid water existed on the surface. No water, no vodka. The Americans were close behind the Russians with Mariner 5 performing a Venus flyby on October 19, 1967. In an early example of US-Soviet cooperation, the data of both Venera 4 and Mariner 5 were combined to better understand this strange world in our planetary vicinity. It showed that Venus was hotter and its atmosphere a lot denser than the scientists had originally anticipated. While US spacecraft never managed to land on Venus, the Russians stayed on target. Stay on target! Only a few iterations later, Venera 7 became the first ever object created by humans to perform a controlled landing on Venus on December 15, 1970. In order to achieve this, the lander was beefed up significantly. It alone weighed 500 kilograms, almost half the weight of the 1180 kilogram large mass of the entire Venera probe. This came from beefed up protection against the elements on Venus, enabling Venera 7 to withstand up to 180 bars of pressure, almost twice that of Venus's atmosphere and temperatures of up to 580 degrees Celsius. This increased the mass in such a way that only a limited number of scientific instruments could be installed. The separation and initial descent of the lander went fine. However, due to a problem with the parachute, the probe impacted harder than it anticipated and probably rolled on its side, limiting its communication capabilities. Still, 20 minutes of data from the surface were transmitted. This enabled scientists to determine the immense heat and pressure existing on Venus's surface that I have mentioned earlier. The data also confirmed that there was no possibility of liquid water existing on Venus. Maybe we could bring vodka? Less than two years later, Venera 8 confirmed these findings, sending bad surface data for more than 50 minutes before failing. It also used a photometer to determine that Venus's thick clouds were only present in the higher parts of the atmosphere, opening up the possibility for photography on the surface level. This, of course, brings us to a milestone in space exploration, Venera 9. While the previous Venera probes were all iterative improvements, this one was a complete redesign. It was supposed to, among other things, send the first pictures from the surface of another planet. If you have watched episode 4 in the series, click right here on top to see that, you may remember that the Soviets already took the first pictures of the surface of the Moon. So of course they were very much interested in how Venus would look like. The Russian designers used what they learned from their previous Venus landings and created a significantly larger lander. It weighed 660 kilograms and rested on a dampening ring to cushion the landing. It also possessed a metal disc that was actually used as a sort of air brake. And of course, there were a bunch of scientific instruments included, as well as the camera to take pictures of the surface. All of this was packed inside a large ball of protective layer about 2.5 meters in diameter, increasing the mass of the vehicle to 1560 kilograms. But this was not all. The lander first had to get to Venus. 
This required a new bus and orbiter system also larger than the previous Venera iterations. The full vehicle was internally known as Venera 75 and its mass was nearly 5 tons, 4936 kilograms to be exact. This was too much for the tried and true Molnia launchers. Instead, the larger and more powerful Proton rocket was used. Shortly after its introduction in the 1960s, it still had a lot of kinks to work out, but now it was already 1975 and the Proton was regarded as reliable enough to try the feat of sending the Venera vehicle to Venus. On June 8, 1975, the vehicle later known as Venera 9 was sent on its way. A few months later, on October 20th, the spacecraft had reached Venus and the lander was separated from the orbiter. The orbiter immediately made a course correction to not also plunge into the deadly Venusian atmosphere. The lander, safe in its protective ball, descended towards the surface. Other balls can take a lot of punishment. When the hottest part of the atmospheric entry was over, the top half of the ball was jettisoned and parachutes slowed the descent. The lower half of the ball was dropped and after cutting the parachutes, the Venera lander sunk to the surface where it touched down with an approximate speed of 7 meters per second. Originally, the Russians had planned to take 360 degree panoramic picture of Venus's surface. However, one of the protective covers that shielded the cameras from the harsh atmospheric journey did not come off. This coincidentally happened with both Venera 9 and its sister craft Venera 10 that landed a few days later. Only about 180 degrees of panorama were sent back to Earth, but still, those were the first images ever to be transmitted from the surface of another planet. An impressive feat then and now. The images presented a rocky surface to the world with the lander's ring-shaped foot and an instrument protruding from it. That was a new surface experiment called a gamma-ray densitometer. It was already used during descent to measure the atmospheric density and then also on the, off the rocky surface. The lander also measured temperature and atmospheric pressure, visible light and infrared levels, as well as many other things. The pictures were of course spectacular, but Venera 9 and 10 yielded a whole bunch of science that required long and thorough study. Venera 9 operated for 53 minutes before communications with the lander ceased. It is widely believed that the vehicle succumbed to the harsh environment that is the hellscape of Venus's surface. However, Anatoly Zak, who runs the in-depth website RussianSpaceWeb.com, quotes a Russian source that the loss of signal was rather due to the orbiter, which acted as a relay to Earth, going out of range than the lander itself failing so quickly. That this design was probably a lot sturdier was proven by Venera 13. This was another lander that made it to the surface. It operated for 127 minutes, more than twice the duration of Venera 9. The probe sent back the first color images from the surface of Venus with more detail than its predecessor. Not only that, Venera 13 and its companion craft Venera 14 also sent back the first audio recordings from another planet. The idea was to measure wind speeds, but this had the side effect to produce the first sounds from a strange world to reach Earth. I have linked to a copy of the recording, it is about 4 minutes in length and an eerie listen consisting of wind noises with interspersed pops and hisses which can be attributed to the lander rather than the planet. The last vehicles used by Soviet Russia to explore Venus were the pair of Vega probes, launched on December 15th and December 21st, 1984. They were similar to the previous Venera designs but also included a balloon probe that would stay in the upper parts of the atmosphere. While in communications range, each Vega balloon traveled almost a third of the planet's circumference a distance of around 11,000 km at an altitude of 53 km on average. Overall, the success rate for Russian Venus missions was around 52%. That is a lot better than their attempts at getting to Mars. Only 15% of those missions were regarded as a success. Two craft managed to reach Mars orbit and one, Mars 6, 
launched on August 5, 1973 on top of a proton rocket, managed to get a lander probe onto the surface of the red planet. However, the data transmitted back was largely unusable due to a design flaw that caused part of the electronics to degrade during the journey to Mars. Meh. It was hard work to explore Venus, that's for sure. Nowadays, you and I just hit up Google Maps and roam around the surface of our planetary neighbor ourselves. This would not have been possible were it not for a lot of pioneering work the Russians did during the 60s and 70s. And we might see a return to Venus in our lifetime. A new generation of spacecraft, Venera D, is being talked about as a possible launch for 2026 or 2031. The vehicle is intended to perform chemical analysis of the surface and also of the atmosphere. Whether or not that will actually happen is something we have to see in a few years. In the meantime, Russia and America have set their focus more closely towards Earth. This included building long-term habitats in low Earth orbit, also known as space stations. If you want to know more about that, subscribe to my channel and activate notifications. Crush the bell. So you'll be updated once we continue with part 7 of Super Sekretnya Stabilnya Raketa, where we explore how Russians became the masters of space stations. Спасибо за просмотр. До свидания. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel for more and follow me on my social thingies. The links are in the description. Also, you can watch one of the two cool videos shown on the right. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.